Second painting of the day. We're back in Central Park, advancing with watercolor, painting in the open air on a beautiful day in May. I'm with a group of 12 other artists, and we're spending this week painting some of the venues of New York City. Um, it's a great adventure, and I'm at a location now that I've gone to before. I like this area. I like to see the the promenade that uh, runs through the middle of Central Park, the public lighting, the cast shadows. Look at that spring green. The, we've hit it at a beautiful time when the the foliage is this wonderful color of green. And this is uh, the painting that has resulted from the session. Um, contrary to the way that I usually create these videos, I'm usually concerned about length. I'm, I'm going to do... Uh, one at regular speed so you can see just how slowly I move. Anyway, <clears throat> um, my thoughts um, on this place are that I would like to show the vendors of Central Park. They, they're a very important kind of feature to the garden. The vendors the park because, of Central Park. Well, a lot of people are walking through, are hungry, uh, want some refreshment. And they have these wonderful canopies so and uh, on, like, beautiful a people piece. working you, what do you have, to, sheep here? to yeah, just make about. the area and feel festive 140? and, and 140 fun. Rough. That's my favorite. Uh, almost every day I think I've had a hot dog. Just I just can't resist. In any case, visually they're, they're quite exciting away. because the Sometimes uh, umbrellas it on, uh, and the, day the stands the themselves are lively colors and they and they stand out against uh, the backdrop of Central Park. In this particular location, it's kind of a crossroads. And I am conscious of people moving back and forth along the pathways. I've, I've thought about uh, where to position myself. My back is a, against a fence so that no one can really uh, come up behind me and it gives me, it puts me out of the main Thoroughfare. I think this is something that the on air artist to has to palette, consider I would is see being out of the so way of yeah. people enjoying it. Next, if you can be on the periphery, right. then uh, I want to go. That's better. Oftentimes, what I'll do is establish sketch uh, my painting all from a that place that where like it's that. the view yeah, that I like. like. In other words, the, yeah, through the umbrella, that's going to be the, the motif presents itself. I'll do my sketch on my paper. Yep. Then I'll take uh, my finished sketch and I'll move to the side yeah, they're just so they're that just I'm not in the way and right. so that I don't have to worry oh, about getting run over oh, or uh, pushed by a dog or, or whatever. Uh, it's, it just makes so the painting going, experience a little more manageable. Out. So I can recommend doing that. Um, I also try to find shade if possible. It's not Some always point, possible, uh, so sometimes what I'll big do wash and is mixing I'll on the page. stand That's what I'm where I can have shade, game, even if it's sure not uh, directly in front of my motif. Sometimes that means turning myself 180 degrees and so that my paper is against the light and I'm in shade. Uh, at least that way I can see with a little more focus uh, what's going on with the paint. It's also helpful in that I'm not distracted to look up constantly to measure my painting against what's uh, in front of me. I would prefer to be able to look at my painting and um, think about what I'm going to do next, respond to what's going on with the watercolor, uh, be able to see things as they're happening with 100% of my attention on the painting. I know from experience and from uh, watching my students that this constant upward glance to the is motif is very distracting. Paper? It yeah, takes you away from what's happening yeah. in the painting. The brush is a little too and much. You get, it's easy to get lost into a um, process of measuring and remeasuring and restating rather than just going with what's happening on the paper. I do a lot of, uh, of uh, painting 
uh, away from the subject. And I can recommend this for people. If, um, if you can get the sketch onto your paper from a view that you like, and then move to yeah, I was, uh, I wanted to, out of the way, maybe out of the sun, it's comfortable. Oh. Completely your painting experience will be much more uh, enjoyable. Unable to, I try, but the occasionally we do need to uh, glance again at our subject. And if you're <laughs> close to it, you just turn over your shoulder and look that way, and you spend a lot, a little bit longer looking at what you're looking for. Uh, it might be a shadow. It might be uh, you've forgotten what the cart looks like. Uh, you're looking for the flower range, whatever it is. I saw the catalog. I was very just You actually spend more time and more thoughtful time in looking at yourself. Does it come to Boston? That show. Okay. So once I've uh, got the position, and once I've got my uh, sketch down. Actually, I should step back one, one more step because I like to consider what I want to say in my painting. Yeah. Even before I start the sketch. They have a, a long-standing relationship. And Salma that Gundy. means Salma Gundy. I'm thinking yeah. about uh, what is the title of this piece going to be. Pretty quickly I arrived on the idea of the vendors. The vendors of Central Park. Um, I, like I said, I've painted in this location before. I'm familiar with some of the uh, vendors. I'm familiar with uh, the plantings, the way that the park is decorated. And this path in particular is a favorite so area of mine. So, so I want to do a painting of uh, the particular. vendors in Central Park Tree. on this spring like afternoon. Well, it's more like uh, foliage, I put the vendors the in the midground. Uh, you see I've cut around well. the umbrellas with the background colors. Drawing some paint the painting right splattering it. Trying to evoke a feeling of the overhead light and light green. So you mix in your palette and the vendors, and on the paper. Uh, especially oh, yeah. the okay. umbrellas, the are displayed with some prominence so that we can the find them quickly. Yeah. Below the umbrellas, the I'll you, be the placing is usually the stalls. Yeah. When you mix on uh, the in front of me, there was only one umbrella, but I decided to include you two because I think it makes it a I know that flick better right statement. Right. <laughs> and <laughs> then I'll I will build the painting from this area, like I'm going to have a, a lot of activity through the middle of the painting. And you get used to people uh, watching people you over walking your shoulder through, too. some dogs, you do. Uh, I mean, the vendors selling just things. Part of it. I do my better painting work. is more of this when, uh, when beautiful I do the green and, up when you and yellow combination. I don't. With watch me. I'm like, I don't. I, I do my best paintings uh, in the foreground is going to be mostly shadows kind of working their way up to where the vendors are. So. My strategy, at least my design in this case, is then to kind of isolate the midground. What I notice uh, in looking at the subject, and we'll revisit this at the end of the painting, is a sort of um, U-shape. If I connect the darks uh, in front of me, there's strong verticals on the left side, there's strong shadows in the foreground, and there's strong verticals, dark verticals on the right side. It's kind of a natural U-shape. Um, and this uh, speaks to a compositional stem. Stems, compositional stems, if I can just talk about this briefly, means um, sort of patterns or templates that uh, seem to work very well for composition, for, for focusing on an area of your painting or a center of interest. The U shape kind of isolates that portion in the middle where we have uh, foot traffic, we have the vendor stalls, etc. So this could work out very well as a means of structuring the lights and darks in the painting. And compositional stems are something that I think about, but I'm not, uh, I don't start with that idea. If my subject fits to one of those ideas, I'll use it. You can read more about this uh, compositional stems, what they are, and how they've derived over time, over centuries in the visual arts, and become patterns that we can rely on. Oh yeah, on the, uh, Edgar Payne has done a great book on Landscape well, painting, always and looking he for that to happen. Yeah. illustrates them and shows for it examples of those historical and really, to his own painting. Uh, creates a bit of it's a great reference for the visual artist, and I really recommend the book because it uh, 
it goes beyond just those stems and, and it talks a lot about what the, the painter should think about as they're composing. In any case, and I'm trying so to get we've the established edge of the a lot of the midtones now. A little bit of those clarity. Greens, uh, passing from the background to the foreground, isolating the umbrellas, uh, which are the left white of the paper, puts a little and slowly creating this pathway, um, the pathway that leads towards the back. Violet and green are great in combination. As I'm, uh, after I finish my drawing of the they complement and I've given because some of the, well, especially if it's a strong stem. yellow. I've given some thought to what I want to say by means of a title. I start to think about a watercolor plan. A watercolor plan. Oh, look how that's bleeding down. Yeah, well, let's just say it's important for the watercolors because it has so much to do with the technical side of things. Up until this point, I've been talking more about the design side of things, but the technical side of things is uh, very important because watercolor reacts a certain way, we need to use uh, time to let things dry, we need to work in a certain pace when we want wet on wet washes, such as, see, as you see in the background. So the watercolor plan is something that I consider before even putting the brush to the paper, well, of course it because it uh, gives me well, sort of a strategy for well, different sections of it's going to drive very fast, how to probably already uh, bring out certain areas, yeah. create but my I focus, some say what I want to say in this painting. Like and it also gives me a certain amount of confidence because once I've thought green, this more through, of a my plasticky green. approach is much more direct. I'm not that's, that's important. That pausing to consider green? what I want to do just before I do it. I've already thought it through, with and the plan does include some, like always includes room for improvisation. If something is happening in a painting and it's giving me a suggestion that could be profitable for this work, I follow that, even if it means going against the watercolor plan. But in general, uh, the watercolor I My watercolor plan areas. tends to think about areas. how I'm going to do certain sections, what sort of technique I'm going to use, what sort of edges I want, what sort of um, uh, passages I want to use in different parts of the painting. And furthermore, when I should do those, the timing aspect. And ideally, I can work from light to dark, background to foreground, broad areas to smaller areas. This all fits into the watercolor plan. Uh, but like I said, I always try to consider I or allow for all this very things that happen <laughs> really, I would um, have. Yes. as I'm painting. I think this, is, this sort of flexibility gives me the means to improvise and follow what's happening in the watercolor. I guess I can't say that enough because <clears throat> being able to remain flexible and really follow what, hap what the media is doing is a technique, is a important uh, mental state to be able to respond to what's happening with the watercolor because it is such a uh, kind of fluid and, and uh, spontaneous media. We need to be able to do that. All right, I'm going for some darks now. The painting's dried a little bit. I'm really thinking about a, a pattern that's going to evoke the umbrellas. Of, I'm going for some dark trees in the background, uh, some strong verticals against all these horizontals. Trying to be gestural with my brushwork. Uh, in some cases, the brush becomes dry and I drag it across the paper, getting a nice broken stroke. All this stuff sort of happens in, the, in uh, my subconscious or uh, happens uh, without much thought these days. I know that when I was beginning and, and struggling with the technique, as we all do, uh, I had to really think much harder about what the brush is doing and what sort of strokes I wanted, but now it seems a little more fluid.
Well, you can see some shadows dancing on my paper. This is uh, Gary, you, part of the joy of darks, or torture, however like you look at it, of working outside. Of, to that there's dark so dark. many distractions. Oh, there's I so put uh, usually complimentary. Uh, people walk in front of me. Yeah, I try to vary like a, in the upper part, maybe a little more of a warmer uh, shoe, for the right. lower down a little more of a cool. to get out of the park. Or uh, vice versa. Lots of noise. Changing uh, it there's all the a time. saxophonist who just plays on and on and on. Uh, maybe you can hear him. I don't know if I turned down the volume. Uh, all sorts of fun things, uh, distractions nonetheless to the painter. Uh, but what can I say? It's, it's you can come a, see if you want. It ends up being a very uh, enjoyable part of the process, and something when I look back at this painting, all those things come back. The coolness of the air, the sound, else. <laughs> of, uh, the music in the background, people laughing, um, the, the way that the wind almost blew my painting over. All these things come back and very, very enjoyable memories. I have to say that uh, I wouldn't trade the experiences for anything, even if it means a lost painting. I don't mind it because the, uh, the joy of the experience remains with me and becomes part of my uh, working skill set. All these things, whether it be dogs walking through, so well, children running, uh, the light streaming down, the smell of the hot dogs in the distance, all these things. Yes, even the smell of the hot dogs. I'm trying to paint that, okay? I, I love this, this, this part of it. and. I don't know how I'm going to paint that. I'll try to imply it. So maybe obvious. if I put a little smoke rising behind the canopies, this would be one way. Yeah. Now the background really is receding. In any case, on we go. This video is going to be a little longer because I'm thinking about your request. Many of you have asked me to show what I look like uh, going in real time. I tend to do the videos more quickly usually about three times the speed. Why? Because I want to get a video to, uh, or a lesson across in about 10 to 15 minutes. That's about our attention span. I feel I can communicate what I want to communicate in about that time. And uh, these longer videos tend to feel a bit plotting to me. Hopefully, you'll get something out of my dialogue uh, to kind of fill the gaps that I'm mixing color or, um, or cleaning my brush or whatever I'm doing that takes a longer amount of time. The brush work certainly takes a little bit of a longer period of time. In any case, you can see these darks now, how they're pushing the umbrellas forward, how they're pushing that green-yellow uh, combination towards the back building up, building up, trying to... Well, I'm working on the left-hand side now. Uh, before on the right-hand side to, to create the depth, but now I'm working on the left-hand side to create this uh, dark frame that I was talking about, this U-shape. I'm trying to do it with uh, sort of calligraphic marks that uh, describe the planters, the trees, uh, the benches, the shadows that are moving across the scene. So I'm very deliberate with the brushwork, trying to keep it moving, trying to keep it fresh. And uh, in my case, what this means is I try to get uh, the object in as few strokes as possible. Um, sometimes these strokes are joined, creating broader passages. Sometimes they're just independent strokes. In any case, this has become a really powerful communicator for me in brushwork. It's something that I learned from my uh, teacher so you years and years ago, Kajiyasu, who was a calligrapher, a Japanese calligrapher. And the way that they use the brush or now. in Asian <laughs> cultures or, not, yeah. or do it now. With <laughs> a lot of passion, a lot of uh, thought and directness and I love that quality in Sumi painting and calligraphy and it's a quality that I want to bring to my watercolor painting a sort of distant uh, 
condensing of what we're looking at into a simple calligraphic pattern that can be expressed with the brush. And I have to say that I consider the brush the most fantastic tool ever invented, especially the watercolor brush. The watercolor brush is designed to carry a large amount of liquid to the paper, to give you a variety of marks. We draw it across the paper, we lead the paint with it, we splatter with it, we do so many things. Gary, do you work it from photographs in the studio, I assume? Oh, yeah. Direct do your paintings attachment come out any differently? My emotional state, uh, I always I'm feel there's a else to say that something but, lost in this uh, it is manifest studio. the brush strokes are, are recreating the sense of form <laughs> light and Thank put God. a splatter here connect Shadow this there yeah we're, we're shapes go deeper value there yeah he needs, to, you know, so uh, he needs a little help you know so uh, we figured the excitement we that i feel the out. energy <laughs> that i feel from certain parts the subtlety that i feel I, the brushes you know, just an amazing you think tool. the ones that are and done I in the studio lose a vibrancy or more something? and more impressed uh, the, I, the, the, I guess I feel the light is different I do uh, work with uh, iPad as you noticed to do some sketching and it has a watercolor feature that I like and I've grown it's taken me about a year to get used to it but I've grown accustomed to it I like it but nothing absolutely I, Nothing replaces the joy and the sensation that I get from the watercolor brush. I think it's a, a marvel. The brushes that I use uh, are using natural hair, squirrel primarily. They're called mop brushes. And the, um, the of course, they, they're designed to hold water and a, a lot of liquid, so they can go, look at this stroke here, I'm going, it's going to cover so much territory with one, with just one dip into the paint. You can go forever, and you can create a shape, you can create a bold mark, you can draw, draw it until it's dry, and then get a second I'm not so sure how. Okay. I've kind of waxed on a lot about <laughs> brushing just because yeah, I think I like it's uh, something I haven't shared with you before. I like when you get that dry and, brush in there. Uh, so I found it's that such a great texture. it's a good opportunity to I'll talk about too. that. So as, it, as I get to the, this stage in the painting, it's starting to present itself. In other words, I can start to see the finish, what I need to do. And it's a good well, feeling because going over there. Um, I won't be guessing as I'm going <laughs> what forward. Pretty sure yeah, where actually, I was retired. Some that of them are making money over there. The dancers. Shadows you know? that includes uh, yeah, accents. Them. And oh, they're things. on vacation like us. So yeah, I worked, uh, you know, a little more methodically from this stage. Still to be done is a connection between the uh, right and left sides along the bottom. Still to be done are figures. <laughs> which I will add, still to be done, are uh, refinements to the, uh, the umbrellas, the public lighting, uh, all of it's these so things. Awesome. But I can like start to, to see it in my mind's eye. Yes. And maybe you've heard artists talk about this before, the mind's eye. What is that exactly? It's basically how we're able to, or what, we're able to see our painting before it's painting, not in its completed state, but enough that we can feel um, good about it. So what I'm doing now is uh, uh, here and there, after adding a stroke, you see me add a brush load of water or another color while it's wet, <laughs> trying to liven up those shapes, make them have some variety, let them uh, interact with the background a little more by touching an edge with water or extending uh, the uh, pigment with color and so on. Well, I've gone to a smaller brush. This is a synthetic brush. This is a synthetic that uh, is good for small marks, for calligraphy, uh, for details. The ones that I use are made by Lowell Cornell. Uh, one of the cheapest brushes you can buy, but just very, very versatile. They're, they have a little bit of a longer uh, length to the, to the brush, to the bristles. 
Um, they have a nice long handle, they have a good balance, and uh, they hold a good amount of pigment. Again, they're, they're made from acrylic, they're synthetic, but even in a synthetic brush, you, they are trying to make it so that you can uh, carry a lot of pigment, a lot of liquid to the page, and still keep their shape. They still keep a nice point. Um, so you start I'm the with type the figure, of painter the who body, and then work your way up likes to, the head. to use the, the torso, side of the brush, legs, legs, to use torso, body, legs, then head. the brush in a yeah. very frayed or dry condition. Yeah, I keep a few brushes that would be thrown right? out yeah, by yeah, very often that's, they just have that's uh, the problem. It looks like a child point. Yeah. They're yeah. dull, right, they're, right. the bristles are worn, some are even bent. But I find these are good for a dry brush. So I keep older brushes until they're practically stubs, sticks, and then I say a little prayer and I let them go. Yeah, so I'm spending a little bit more time kind of agonizing through the mid-ground here. Here you see that first shadow. I'm going to be placing figures on top of that shadow. Some def uh, definitions. Uh, this is a nice connector. Done with a dry brush. Look at how the stroke breaks up at the end. That's an important stroke. It's not <laughs> accidental. You might get hurt here. <laughs> and Everybody sometimes in the field, um, we hope. I think I got a phone call and it disrupted my video. So I couldn't show you the, the final passages. But I'm showing them to you now in the finished piece. Look at those shadows on the bottom of the painting. Those were strokes I wanted to show you. They were done very quickly with a broad brush, extending the tone, the dark tone that's on the left all the way across to the right and joining with that right-hand passage. Um, and onto that shadow, I joined it with a, a man and his dog walking through. Uh, very common to see dog walkers. Uh, it's real fun. I love it. And um, the middle column, another dog walking towards the, uh, the stand. And then uh, we find the umbrellas, the umbrellas and the, the vendors in the shadows. So this is uh, kind of the culmination of an idea that was born and painted uh, in front of my subject uh, in plein air. A great experience. And I can't recommend it enough to all of you painters. Uh, to get out in the urban environment, to get out in the parks, to get out by the beaches, uh, by the working docks, and have a day of painting. It's a great way to spend a day.